Good evening. I'm happy to be with you this evening. I was very happy to be here for the Arati and to share in this very spiritual moment, in this very spiritual place. I could begin by adding to my um, introductory remarks that were just made, my gratitude to Swami for contacting me, hearing that I was in Sydney and inviting me to come, and to all the Swamis here for their warm welcome this evening, and for all of you coming out on a cold winter night. Australian style cold winter night, <laughs> not American style. Uh, I should say also perhaps it would help that um, I have had uh, wonderful relationships for which I am grateful with the Ramakrishna order and the Swamis for many years. I was saying to Swami before that I was happy even in the 1980s to go to uh, Gold Park and Swami Lokeshwar Ananda invited me to give some talks there in Boston, uh, Swami Sarvagatananda, a longtime Swami, was there 40 or 50 years. I used to invite him to the Jesuit college to give some talks, and then he would invite me to speak on Sunday morning at the Vedanta Society in Boston. And then my good friend in Boston, Swami Tyagananda, who I think has also visited here in Australia, he, I knew him in Madras, in Mylapur, when he was at Vedanta Keshari. And now I know him also in Boston, where he is the chief Swami, taking Swami Sarvagatananda's place. So I have many connections with the order. But I think also, uh, when Swami mentioned that my field is comparative theology, which is not my topic tonight, but rather the idea that we don't have to be afraid of learning from other religious traditions other than our own, but that we can benefit from learning from how other people worship, how other people see God, how other people have mystical experience. I think one of my early insights into the possibility was from reading the stories of Sri Ramakrishna. Uh, the great master and the gospel both showed me that one can take delight, one can find great joy in learning from religious diversity. Sometimes Westerners talk about the problem of many religions, or the problem of diversity. And I think Sri Ramakrishna and then Swami Vivekananda also say, let us rejoice in the myriad possibilities. And I think that is also part of the spirit of my comments tonight. So the topic that I have is not exactly what you came for. So if you came to hear about the significance of prayer, uh, you could leave now, um, <laughs> since that isn't quite, we were provisionally making up topics, and this seemed to be a topic that was good enough for the uh, idea a few weeks, uh, a few days ago. But I thought that tonight I would turn more directly to the topic of how great teachers teach. How do we come here? How do we learn the traditions that we belong to? Hindu traditions, Christian tradition, other traditions that may be here tonight. We learn it obviously through growing up with the traditions. We learn it through our mothers, our fathers, our families. We learn it through worship in holy places. And we learn it through the teachers both living and of the great tradition before us. Sometimes the tradition is somewhat catechetical. Question and answer, here are the things to memorize, here are the things that you should know about the faith. And sometimes you have great thinkers like Shankaracharya, Ramanujacharya, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine in the Christian tradition, who give kind of systematic teachings. And they have a first point, a second point, a third point, a conclusion. The logic is argued. And those are all wonderful texts as well. But I was thinking tonight that there's also teaching by parables. And the handout that you have, I think, will lead us into this topic. That the great teachers, and I think this could be shown with many traditions, but I'll begin with my own, with the stories of Jesus tonight, often turn to simple examples from everyday life, and then open them up to show a deeper spiritual meaning of ordinary life, and also how ordinary things can show us the way to God. And that you don't need to have great learning you don't need to have the PhD or the doctorate. You don't need to have a whole shelf of books. But if you open your eyes and pay attention to the world around you, then you can begin to understand. 
when I use in the title, on uh, the handout that you have, Jesus' teachings in parables, according to Matthew chapter 13, the word parable is a word that comes up commonly in the Gospels. And it literally means like throwing something alongside. So you're trying to make a teaching, and then you throw out something extra and say, maybe this will help you. So you try this, you try that, that doesn't work, that doesn't work. So you throw this out there and say, think of this example from nature. Think about these people we know. Think about history. And these things may help you as well. In particular, Jesus, in giving parables, was also at a difficult moment in his ministry. So this is chapter 13 of the Gospel according to St. Matthew. And in chapter 12, he's been arguing with the leaders of the people who are rejecting his teaching and kind of hardening their hearts, saying, you're a troublemaker, we don't really need your teaching, we already have everything we need. And Jesus is running into more and more resistance from the leaders of the people. And as we know, it leads eventually to his death on the cross. But I think at this point in chapter 13, he says, I have come to preach the kingdom of God. And I've come to talk about God's presence in the world. Giving the straight out teachings and saying this and this and this doesn't seem to be working. So let me talk about it through throwing out these extra stories and see if that works. And what's extraordinary about chapter 13 of the Gospel according to Matthew is that over and over again, Jesus just keeps adding parables and stories. And these stories from ordinary life are meant to give us a spiritual meaning that is greater than the stories themselves. So what I'd like to do in the time we have tonight is first of all go through the key stories in chapter 13 of the Gospel according to Matthew. <clears throat> and you have them on the handout. Uh, there may be more copies in the back if anyone didn't get the handout. But I think it may help you and I'll read some of them so you can follow along also. But I think again these stories are meant to be both individually clear, and then adding them up, they keep kind of making more vivid, more concrete, the meaning of the kingdom of God. So the first one, for instance, the parable of the sower. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. So a very special moment. Uh, it's so crowded on the beach, he has to get into a boat to find a place to sit. He told them many things in parables. Listen, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no roots, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with them and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone who has ears listen. The first thing to say about this parable is that this would make sense to the people to whom Jesus was speaking. They were farmers. They were villagers. They didn't have to take them on a tour of nature to show them what sowing the seed was about, because they did this all year long. If they didn't do it, they wouldn't eat. So they did this, they grew things, and they ate what they grew. And so they knew about nature, and they're looking for spiritual teaching. And Jesus is saying to them, don't come to me expecting something like dropped from heaven that has nothing to do with your ordinary lives. But let's talk about what you do every day. So when you sow the seed, does all the seed grow up? Does all the seed 100% come to fruition? No. And again, he's thinking, he's running into opposition. Some people are listening to him, they're clinging to his every word. Some people listen once and turn away. Other people stand there with an angry look on their face and say, this man is a big pain in the neck. We don't want him here. And I think he's saying, should this surprise you? You live by the bread of life. You live by the bread you grow. But think of what happens to the seed. 
So you throw the seeds out there, it lands on the ground. Some seeds don't make it at all. Immediately they're picked up and the birds eat them and they're gone. As it says, other seeds fall on rocky ground. The soil is so superficial and hardly deep at all. They grow up quickly and they fall over and they're gone. People who have a spiritual life that lasts for a little bit of time, they're very enthusiastic, they're very excited, this is wonderful, I love all of this, and then two days later, they forget about it. They're gone. And others whose lives aren't as simple as they hoped they would be, but the, the wheat grows up, the fruit grows up, and the thorns grow with it, and they're choked. And I think Jesus is pointing in a very simple way, when grain grows, when the fruits grow, there's always competition. And we want the fruit, we want the grain, we want the bread of life. But other things grow up that only pain us, that only stick us, that actually end up killing the grain that we want. And he's saying to them, you know all of this. You know this from your daily life. And some of the grain finally falls on good soil. The birds don't get it. It's deep, rich soil. It doesn't shrivel up in the day sun. It's not on the rocks. It grows up. And even that seed, some of it is more productive than others. And again, I think here he's saying, you know this, that you look at the seed, and it all looks like, well, this is just seed. There's dirt, here's seed, throw it, it grows up. But some of the seed brings out 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And it's kind of the mystery. We all in our lives can be given the same spiritual opportunities. We all have these possibilities. And if we're not those who are like choked by our worldly cares and temptations, or those who turn away after a few days, you can look around and say, well, look, the people I know, we all had the same opportunities. And some people seem to devote their lives entirely to God. Some people give themselves 100%. And other people, it's sort of half and half, you know, good people. But I have many things to think about. Religion is just one of them. God is just one of them. And other people, as in my tradition, they'll come to church on Sunday. They'll come for the baptism. They'll come for the wedding. They'll come for the funeral. They'll come at Christmas. They'll come at Easter. And then you don't see them the rest of the year. That's like the 30%. And these are good people, but they only give part of themselves. And I think what Jesus is saying, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And again, people are expecting the kingdom of God to be the heavens opening and chariots of fire coming down and God coming with a sword and kicking King Herod off his throne and driving the Romans out and the Messiah will come and go to Jerusalem and sit on a throne and the people will be safe forever. And you can imagine how they'd be puzzled, Jesus saying, the kingdom of God is what you already know. It's like sowing seed. And little by little, it grows. And if you're expecting anything big, it's like saying you throw the grain out, and then you come back about two hours later and are looking for your dinner. It's not going to happen. And if you expect the kingdom of God will come and we'll all come marching in together 100% ready, it's not going to happen. So this is the, the first of the parables that Jesus tells in this chapter about how from ordinary life we know that things grow in different ways and certain things don't grow. And we can look at our lives and say, if the kingdom of God is within us, as Jesus says in another part of the Gospel, there are times in my life when the seed seems to grow, and I flourish, and I find God easily, and other times I feel it's all thorns, it's all rocks, or birds are eating me away and there's nothing left. So he begins with this parable. The next parable is kind of a mystery about why is it that good and evil come together. And it's kind of a different kind of story because it's not exactly natural. It has a kind of plot to it. Jesus then put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in the field, like the end of the previous parable. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. So the slaves of the householder came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did these weeds come from? And he says, some enemy has done this. The slave said, do you want us to go and gather or pull out all these weeds? And the master said, no, for in pulling out the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. 
Let them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, bind them into bundles to be burned, and then gather the wheat into my barn. Again, this would be not something exotic, esoteric, that you have to like imagine entirely in another spiritual realm. But these are farmers again. And while this has a plot to it, some enemy comes. Maybe your neighbor is jealous of your property, or somebody you ignored on the street, or somebody had a fight with your family, sneaks in at night and starts throwing weeds, uh, seeds for the weeds in. But I think it also, then you can see there's a spiritual point. If God is the good sower of the seed, if God brings and throws the kingdom into our midst, why is it that in our experience there's so much evil in the world? Now Jesus is not giving like a major treatise, a philosophical exposition of what is evil, why there is evil. But rather he's saying, in our experience, the good and the bad are mixed together. In fact, in my own heart, the good and the bad are mixed together. And if you try to sort it out and say, well, I'm going to you know, get a spiritual sword and I'm going to cut out all the bad parts and leave only the good parts, well, then you'll be in pieces. You'll be like a jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces, and you'll be dead also. That's another thing. But it's all this kind of sense that you can't go through your life and say, I'm going to root out all the evil, and then what's left of me will be pure. Or I'm going to go through society. I'm going to go through the community and get rid of all the bad people. Or I'm going to go to the city and get rid of all the bad people. Or I'll go in the nation, I'll go in the whole world and get rid of all the bad people, and then only good will be. And I think Jesus is saying, have you ever tried that in your field? And I, I'm not a farmer, and I actually haven't grown wheat and had uh, weeds among the wheat. But I guess the idea is when you pull them out, everything gets ripped up at once. And then the, the good grain is killed. But if you wait until the harvest, when things have grown fully, it's much easier to do. And it's a kind of extraordinary image for thinking about the fact. It's not explaining evil or why evil. But it's really putting before us God is like the farmer, God is like the owner, who says at a certain time you have to tolerate the good and the bad together for the sake of the good in the long run. And that anybody who's kind of a fundamentalist, an extremist, who wants to get rid of everything altogether all at once would be a bad farmer. So I'm going to go out into my field and I'm going to get rid of those weeds and then they finally do it and they look and they have an empty field because they've ripped up everything and then there's nothing. And I think Jesus is saying God is like that both with society and the world and with you and me. The kingdom of God is within you. How is it that God tolerates us when we're not as good as we should be or when we miss the graces or when we don't allow the seed to grow? God is looking at us and saying Ultimately, this is going to work out. You will come to harvest, you'll bear fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. But for now, you know, you're in the middle of your life somewhere. The good and the bad are mixed together. Don't worry in the long run. I mean, we might say in our one life, perhaps in a Hindu tradition, you could say in the next life or the life after. It'll work out. The kingdom of God is like the weeds among the wheat. Another of the parables, he goes on really to start talking now about the mystery of the kingdom of God. Again, he's talking to people who either don't know what he's talking about at all, what is the kingdom of God, or have this idea of a throne in Jerusalem and the Romans chased out and a good king on the throne. And he's trying to say, don't think of those big images, don't think of armies, don't think of kings, don't think of messiahs coming down from heaven, but pay attention to nature around you and you will realize it's already happening now. So he put before them another parable. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Again, he's saying what people already know but they've never thought about it having a spiritual meaning. So I guess you know these people in the village, the people standing on the beach listening to him, grow mustard seed. They, they make mustard and spice up their food and so on like that. And they've never thought about something so common and so ordinary as growing the mustard. 
and seeing that grow up to these big bushes where the, the birds come and are in the branches, and imagining that this had a spiritual meaning. No, I, I come to temple, I come to synagogue, I come to church, you know, I seek seeking spiritual meaning, but my ordinary life doesn't teach me anything. Now Jesus is saying, look at your life as it is, and you'll realize it's already a miracle at work. So again, I've done this in church sometimes on Sunday when this gospel comes up, <coughs> is bring in some mustard seeds. And I hold up like a mustard seed to the congregation. Of course, they, they don't even know if I have anything in my fingers. Um, it looks like I just have fingers. I say, here's a mustard seed. And then I like throw it out, and the kids look for it, and they can't find it because it disappeared under the pew. It's tiny. And the other tiny seeds as well. But the miracle of it is, if you look at it and say, well, that's absolutely useless. What good is a tiny mustard seed? Throw it out. Forget it. No. Jesus said, you know what happens. You plant a seed. It's tiny. People can barely see it. There's hardly any sense, common sense, that anything will come of this. But year after year, season after season, the seed grows up into something large. It gives you the mustard you're looking for. It becomes a home for the birds. Perhaps it provides shade. Isn't that wonderful? But it requires faith on your part that when you go out there and throw that seed in the ground, something big and shady and comfortable for the birds and good for your table will come out of it. We might think of other plants. Let's say in America you might think of an apple tree. You plant that seed and for years nothing much comes and finally the the tree is growing up, and finally, after five or ten years, again, I'm not a farmer, I'm from New York City, I have no idea. The seed grows up, and finally there's a tree, and finally you start to see apples on the tree. But if you said, look, I put the seed in the ground, and I want apples from that tree, and I want them within six months, or cut down that tree. Or I'll give any plant a certain amount of time, and then cut it down, you'll end up starving to death, because you've given nothing patience. And Jesus said, okay, you got that? That's what the kingdom of God is like. You're impatient people, he's telling them standing on the shore. You want something immediately. They didn't have wristwatches in those days, but they're sort of all looking at their watches saying, is the kingdom of God coming now or in five minutes? They're saying, forget that. It's like everything else in your life, it takes time. And I think on a personal level, we might extend it and say, you want to be a saint. You want to be holy. I want to see God. And I tried it, and nothing happened. And I tried it for a year, and nothing happened. And I tried it for two years, and nothing happened. Jesus is saying, well, you allow the mustard seed to grow, and you allow it to take its time. You allow the apple tree to grow, and it takes its time. Why is it you can't give yourself time? So the seeds of the Word, the wisdom of God, the teaching that's given, don't expect immediate results. A little at a time. A little at a time. And we have, you know, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years, 100 years of life. Take your time. It will grow up. The seasons will change, and God will be with you. The kingdom of God is the mysterious seed that's so tiny you can hardly believe in it, but it's growing even as we sit here. So you can see he's trying to get his people listening to pay attention to their daily experience to learn to be patient in the spiritual life. And he's done it a third time. The next one is very similar, and you can just take a moment on it. He told them another parable, the kingdom of God, the uh, kingdom of heaven is like yeast that the woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. And then I suppose she goes on, lets it rise makes the bread, puts it in the oven, and it bakes. What's the difference between this parable and the previous one? Well, you have the mustard seed, and you can put it in the ground. And the mustard seed is not the earth, but it's in the earth. But when you mix the yeast in with the bread, with the flour, it seems to disappear. And sometimes, I remember once when I was um, in seminary, and I was living in a house where we had to take turns cooking, I made, a, I, my mother gave me a recipe for making a loaf of bread, and I followed the recipe exactly, and then when it came out of the oven, it was like flat like a rock, and you could like use it as a frisbee or something like that, because I put in everything in exactly according to the rules, but I left the yeast out. 
And so it just was flat and hard and inedible. You look at the dough, and you've made the dough and all that. How do you know if the yeast is in it or not? If you didn't put it in, it looks the same. If you put it in, it looks the same. And I think, again, the idea is that there's something mysterious going on, and you look around and say, is that just flour, or does it have something in it that's going to make it grow and expand and become edible? If you look at somebody and say, is there yeast in their life? Is there something there that's growing? You can say, well, this one has yeast, and that one has yeast, and that one has yeast, and that one doesn't, and that one doesn't. But rather, it's an invisible process that you again, he's saying perhaps to the women who are cooking in the kitchen, every day you make your bread. Every day you faithfully trust that putting the yeast in and then it disappears is important to do because if you leave out the yeast, you can't eat it. The word of God, the teaching of the teacher, the wisdom of the scriptures is that invisible yeast, it gets lost in your life and suddenly you realize you begin to grow. So it's another way of saying the same as the previous parable. It takes time, there's invisible action, and if you're looking for the kingdom of God to be in headlights uh, with big neon signs and all that, forget it. Because the kingdom of God is simple, invisible, and it's growing right now. So again, he's trying to change the way they think about the kingdom of God, not about these big structures, but about the simple things of life teaching you how God's kingdom comes about. The next three of these, and these are really the last parables, and then there's kind of a, a teaching about the parables that Jesus gives. The next parables are about people who are wise in seeking the kingdom of God. So the previous parables really talk about what happens when the sower sows the seed, when the seeds begin to grow, being patient and letting it happen. The next three are sort of saying to his readers, you got the first ones? You understand what's going on? Now I'm going to put you on the spot he says, and ask you if you're wise enough to know where to find the kingdom of God in your life and what to do if you find it. The kingdom of God is like a treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. It's like seizing the moment. So you're going through the field. Now again, I, I can't imagine that the villagers were doing this every day, tripping over gold buried in the field or treasure chest or whatever. But this moment where suddenly you realize this field, which looks like an ordinary field, and it's just dirt and grass and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, suddenly there's something incredibly valuable buried in that field. And nobody knows about it, and it's been there for a thousand years, and it's been entirely forgotten. And you say, well, that's interesting. And then you go home and forget about it. No. The moment comes and you are given kind of an opportunity that others don't have. And you're really put in a moment of crisis. Do you really want that treasure or not? And unfortunately, it's a very expensive field, apparently, because he has to sell everything that he owns in order to get that field. And you say, well, you know, maybe I'll buy the field and somebody else will have found it by then. Or maybe it looks like gold, but it's only gold paint. Or maybe it's not really silver, but it's just um, you know, aluminum or something like that. Um, I better not take a risk. I better play it safe. Or maybe I'll just try to steal it and walk away with it. And then I'll feel guilty the rest of my life. And Jesus is saying, I think, if you really care and you pretend you're standing here on the beach and you're listening to my discourse and you pretend that the Word of God really matters to you, are you really the kind of person who's bold enough to sell everything in order to get the treasure? Other people walk through that field, they don't see it. Other people walk over it every day and they miss it. Something about you at this moment in your life, it's there, it's visible, what are you going to do? And I think this too is a truth that we probably could reflect on about 10 of us or 100 of us can hear a certain word spoken to us, can hear a song or a hymn being sung, can see something on TV, read something on the internet, be walking down the street and see something happening. And 100 people see it, and for 99, oh, that's interesting, or it's not even interesting, I forgot it, I was looking at my phone, I missed it, and just go on. 
and suddenly you're the hundredth person who realizes that field, that street corner, that TV screen, that moment in temple or church, suddenly there's an enormous, magnificent treasure there, but it's expensive. <clears throat> the kingdom of God does not come cheap. And I think he's really saying to them, if you're a coward, if you're cautious, if you're prudent, that yet you'll get 30-fold, you're not going to get 100-fold. So he puts it forward in that simple fashion. The second one is sort of the same thing, but it's a slightly different scenario. Again, the kingdom of God is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the first parable, I'm not like a merchant of fine fields. I was just walking through the field and I tripped on something and it turned out to be a pre treasure and I decided to risk everything and buy the field. This is a merchant who spends his life or her life going around looking for precious pearls. And there are probably 10 other pearl merchants at the same time going through the marketplace looking at all these things on sale, looking for the one pearl of great price. And you have to know what you're doing. Um, you know, I can look at it and say, is this a real pearl or not? I have no idea. Is this one valuable or not? Well, it's bigger. It doesn't mean it's more valuable. So you really have to know what you're doing and be kind of a connoisseur. Uh, just like, um, I mean, anything, anything you buy, I mean, a, a work of art, is it fake or not? Um, some item that seems to be on sale and really cheap, is it junk or not? But he goes into the marketplace and everybody else is looking and suddenly he finds it. And he kind of like pushes it back into the pile and realizes the cost of this is really expensive. And I really have to be sure that it's the real thing. And if it's the real thing, I have to sell everything that I have in order to get it. And again, it's like hearing, you can hear the scriptures being read a thousand times and it passes you by, but suddenly your moment comes. You've been a pearl merchant your whole life. And suddenly at this moment, the pearl of great price, the incomparable pearl, the greatest of treasures is suddenly there. And Jesus is saying, are you courageous enough to let go of the rest of your life so that you can get that pearl? The kingdom of God comes and goes. The kingdom of God is like there for a moment and then gone. And you may not get a chance for years again. You want to be a spiritual person, you want to see God, this was the moment. And he's sort of daring them, sell everything and take that pearl. And then finally, one more, uh, again, a quite different kind. The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, they sat down and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous. They will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now this is a complicated parable. They get, parables often get complicated. It's about the end of the world. It's about the final division of good and evil. Like the, the sower and the seed, you know, the wheat grows up and the weeds grow up and you separate them out. But I think, the, for me, the more interesting part is the first part, the fishermen. So they're standing on the shore of the lake. A lot of these people are fishermen, just like Jesus' apostles were fishermen, many of them. Every day you go out on the lake, you bring in the fish, and you realize that no matter what a good fisherman you are, some of them are not really edible. Uh, maybe they're sick, maybe they're too small, maybe they're too old, and you have to throw them back or throw them away. Professional fishermen know what they're doing. They can probably, it doesn't take like an hour to look at each fish and figure out is it good or not. They can do this really quickly. Like the man or woman in the marketplace selling fruit or vegetables. They know exactly what they're doing and they can do it very quickly. Skill in the kingdom of God is to be able to show the difference between the real and the fake. So as Jesus says in another part of the gospel, all kinds of people are going to come and be saying to you, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And a lot of them are lying to you. They're faking. It's not true. They're just saying things. They want to be great preachers. They want to be honored. They want to be understood. And they're making it up. And he's sort of daring his people to say, you're fishermen. You know how to do it with fish. Which are the good and which are the bad? 
like the angels at the end of the world and knowing the good and the bad, can you tell the true preaching of the kingdom from the fake preaching of the kingdom? Can you tell the true word of God from the fake word of God? Can you tell the true spiritual path from the fake <clears throat> spiritual path? And he's sort of saying to them, you've got to learn to do this. You know how to farm. You know how to make bread. You can tell something about pearls. You can tell something about the fish that you fish for every day. You want to be a spiritual person, you better be able to sort out the real and the fake. Don't expect somebody to do it for you. At a certain point, you've got to do it for yourself. So these are all parables of the kingdom. He's never actually said what exactly is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like the sower and the seed. It's like the wheat and the weeds. It's like the yeast and the loaf. It's like the mustard seed. And so on and so on. It's like this, it's like this. What is the kingdom of God? If you understand the world around you, you're getting a sense of what the kingdom is. Your life teaches you the things of God. And he concludes with these two passages, have you understood all of this? And they answer, yes. Now this is probably like the teacher in class, have you understood everything? Yes, teacher, everything I understand. And probably half of them have no idea what he's talking about. Because these are obscure. You know, we've heard them, Christians have heard them for 2,000 years, and, and it's, not, it's not new teaching. But to have a teacher doing such deceptively simple teaching, we came to hear religious message, and he's talking to us about farming, fields, making bread, buying pearls, etc., etc. So anyway, they claim, yes, that they understand it. Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. He finished his parables and left that place. I would just stress here the idea of the new and the old, that I think in any religious path, thinking of God, the kingdom of God, it's always in a way going to be as old as the world, as familiar as our tradition. We've heard this a thousand times, our teachers have taught it a thousand times. It's not new, it's old, and that's good. But suddenly, now, Jesus in the boat, the people on the shore, it's new. And the real teacher is able to take the old things, the things we thought we knew perfectly well, and make them suddenly seem so new that right now you've got to sell everything and grab them. And I think Jesus is sort of saying that. The old is the new, the new is the old. If it's just old, it's boring, it's stale, young people turn away from it, forget it. And if it's just new, you say, well, this isn't our tradition. This isn't where we come from. Our teachers haven't said this. It's just new. It's old and new, woven together. That's what the master of the house is like. That's what the person who knows the kingdom of God is like. The old and the new together. I put out of, um, if you look at the little numbers there, I'm giving you the verse numbers, which I haven't mentioned. But this passage is in the middle of the chapter, and I put it last, because it kind of summarizes what Jesus thinks about parables. Jesus told the crowds all of these things in parables. Without a parable, he told them nothing. Story after story, example after example from ordinary life. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth to speak in parables. I will proclaim what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. And this is quite an outrageous thing to say. Because Jesus is just sitting there in the boat talking about farming, fishing, shopping, making bread. And these are the secrets that have been hidden since the beginning of the world. Again, people are waiting for the heavens to be open and the secret Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of the Holies and the angels of God to come down. You know, give us a show. Put on something we've never seen before. And Jesus is saying the secret that has been hidden from the beginning of the world is that your ordinary life is full of the kingdom of God. Everything in your life is teaching you about God. Everything in your daily experience is teaching you. So I'm sitting here in the boat, you're sitting there on the shore, listening to me. I'm not always going to be sitting here in the boat, you're not always going to be on the shore. But when Jesus says, when I'm not here anymore, your life will continue to teach you. The patterns of nature, domestic life, making food, making the things you eat from day to day, buying and selling, shopping, fishing, all of those things are your teacher when the teacher is not around. And things that seem to have been hidden 
from the very beginning of time, the great mysteries that the priests in Jerusalem and the great scribes and teachers spend their lives puttering through the books. You have it. It's your field. It's your kitchen. It's your boat. So the parables are really, really simple and really, really profound. And I think Jesus would say, if you get one of them, you got the whole thing. If you understand any of this, you know about the kingdom of God. Now I could stop here. Swami told me I could go on for an hour, so I won't stop here. I could stop here, but as Swami pointed out, I'm a comparative theologian, and I believe that we can learn from multiple traditions at once. So when I was thinking about this during the week, saying, well, it would be kind of a little bit disappointing to say in 2017, the Christian learns from the gospel, the Hindu learns from the Hindu text, the Muslim from the Muslim text, etc. You know, we've done that, we've been there. Can we do more? So I started thinking, and I didn't have all my books with me, I didn't bring all my books from Boston with me when I came to Australia. I, I went online to the Gospel of Ramakrishna, one of my favorite texts of India, and looked up and typed in you know, the word parable, the word story, and came up with all these marvelous passages from the Gospel, and I'm sure I'll go briefer here because I'm sure many of you know these by heart. But the sense that another great teacher, Ramakrishna, Sri Ramakrishna, wasn't going to give you simply a catechism, you memorize the answers and I'll give you the questions. He wasn't going to write out a creed. He wasn't going to sit down and write a big systematic doctrinal text, you know, hundreds of pages in Sanskrit or something like that. But Sri Ramakrishna, just like Jesus, is sort of saying your ordinary life and the stories of ordinary life will tell you the mystery of the real and the unreal. And I think reading Ramakrishna after Jesus, you could do it the other way. You could read Ramakrishna first and then Jesus, opens up across religious boundaries some of the same mystery, whether you call it the kingdom of God, or the real and the unreal, or the absolute and the relative. But I picked out three of the parables. I picked three because three got me to the bottom of the second page, and I had to stop there. I didn't want to have a five-page handout or something like that, so I stopped on page. But I picked three, and you may think of others that would be better fitting. But I'll go through these again fairly quickly, and I'll we'll be done before 8.30. So let me tell you a story. And there are so many scenes in the Gospel where Ramakrishna says this. Uh, I think he rarely uses, I mean, we're talking about translation from the Bengali, but the, the word parable comes up much less than the word story. So let me tell you a story, let me tell you a story, listen to this story. And the stories are invariably amusing, simple, easily accessible. You don't need a PhD or a master's degree to get them. You don't need pen and paper to understand what he's talking about. So he tells a story. Let me tell you a story. In the forest there lived a holy man who had many disciples. One day he taught them to see God in all beings. And knowing this, to bow low before them all. A beautiful message. We could stop there. A disciple went to the forest to gather wood for the sacrificial fire. So he's a, a very orthodox person. He's going to make his sacrificial fire. He forgot the fact that God is everywhere in all things, but he's going to make a fire to worship God. Suddenly he heard an outcry, get out of the way, get out of the way, a mad elephant is coming. But all the disciple um, of the holy, all, all but the disciple of the holy man took to their heels and ran away because you don't want to get trampled by an elephant. He reasoned that the elephant was also God in another form, so why should he run away from it? So he stood there, bowed before the animal, and began to sing its praises. So he's a good student, but not the brightest student in the class. <laughs> I mean, he sort of gets it, but doesn't get it 100%. God is in all things, God is everywhere. This elephant is rushing toward me, it's so beautiful, this is God too. And he begins to praise the elephant as God. And the mahout of the elephant is like looking at this guy and saying, um, you know, run away, run away. But the disciple didn't move. The animal seized him with its trunk, cast him to one side, and continued on its way. Very nice of the elephant not to kill him, but to just throw him out of the way. Hurt and bruised, the disciple lay unconscious on the ground, Hearing what had happened, his teacher and his brother disciples came to him and carried him to the hermitage. With some medicine, he soon regained consciousness. And someone asked, 
You knew the elephant was coming. Why didn't you leave the place? Why didn't you get out of the way? I said, I listened to my teacher. My teacher told me that God himself had taken all these forms of animals as well as men. Therefore, thinking that it was only the elephant God coming toward me, I didn't run away. The teacher said, yes, my child, it is true that the elephant God was coming, but the mahout who's telling you, get out of the way, that mahout God, sitting on the elephant's back, girding, you know, goading it on, forbade you to stay there. Since everything manifests God, why didn't you trust the Mahout's words too? You should have heeded the Mahout God's word. Uh, I think it goes on in the text to say, and everybody laughed because the point was very clear. And you can see, this is a simple story. Now, I don't think this isn't as simple as the gospel stories in Matthew. Like, I'm sure not every day in the forest people were being trampled by elephants and so on, but it happened probably enough that people could imagine this. An entertaining story that suddenly takes the Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, out of the classroom, out of the Shastra, out of the Upanishads, and said, imagine you're there in the forest and an elephant comes running toward you. What do you do? The forest is God, God the ground is God, the elephant is God. I'll stop there. I got 30%, 60%. The teacher says, no, but the guy sitting on the elephant is God too. Why don't you pay attention to the whole story? You pay attention to the elephant part of the story, and you get bruised and broken. The Mahout part of the story takes it even further and says, get out of, God says to you, get out of the way of God who's going to be trampled, or something like that. And you can see it, it becomes a bit complicated, but I think Ramakrishna is trying to say in a simple fashion, if you really want the package of what God is like, and finding God in all things, in all things, everything is a clue. Not just the parts that you think are natural or beautiful or simple. Not just the beautiful animal, but also the guy sitting on the animal. Not just the thing of nature, but the man who has these words in his mouth, get out of the way. And so Ramakrishna, without any elaborate Shastra, is saying, if God is in all things, you have to listen to nature, you have to pay attention to animals, you have to listen to what people say, not just to your teacher during class, but if somebody on the street says to you, get out of the way, watch this, it's dangerous, don't do that, listen to your neighbors, listen to people who are trying to give you good advice, because God is there too. And I think, to tell you the truth, I think so often we can say, I love walking on the ocean and the beauties of nature speak to me, or the mountaintop or seeing the full moon, or the birds and the bees and the elephants and the flowers, all of this is gorgeous. But if the guy next to me on the bus or the next to me on the street says something to me, that's so annoying, I wish they'd leave me alone. I'm thinking of spiritual <laughs> things. And Sri Ramakrishna is saying, all of it speaks to you of God. Everything speaks of God, don't stop short. The point tonight, of course, is that it's a simple story. He entertains his listeners, he's sitting there in someone's house, and tells this story and says, don't you get it? It's much bigger than you thought. The second one is another simple one. Again, it begins the same way. Listen to a story. Once a man entered a wood and saw a small animal on a tree. He came back and told another man that he had seen a creature of a beautiful red color on a certain tree. The second man replied, well, I went into the wood and I also saw that animal but why do you call it red? It's actually green. Another one who was present contradicted them both and said, no, it was yellow. Others arrived and contended that it was gray or violet or blue and so forth and so on. So they started quarreling among themselves. To settle the dispute, they all went to the tree. They saw a man sitting under the tree. They asked him about it. And he said, yes, I live under this tree. I know this animal very well. All your descriptions are true. Sometimes it appears red, sometimes yellow, sometimes blue, violet, gray, and so on. It's a chameleon. Sometimes it has no color at all. Now it has color, now it has none. In like manner, one who constantly thinks of God can know his real nature. He alone knows that God reveals himself to seekers in various forms and aspects. God has attributes, then again, God has no attributes. 
Only the man who lives under the tree knows that the chameleon can appear in various colors, and he knows further that the animal at times has no color at all. Others suffer the agony of futile argument. Again, in a simple detail that I think in Ramakrishna's India of the 19th century, people would immediately pick up on, thank God I don't have to know Sanskrit, thank God I don't have to have read the Upanishads, I know exactly what this chameleon is, I know about that animal, that it changes colors depending on the background, so it disguises itself against its enemies. And I know how, isn't this absurd, that people are saying it's this color or that color, when anybody who's ever lived in a village near the jungle would say, well, obviously it's not one or the other, it's both. It appears this color, that color, that color, that color. And I think the added point, perhaps, is who is it who knows this? The person who doesn't just go running through the forest, see something interesting, and then take off to report it. But whoever this person is who lives under the tree is the person who sticks with nature long enough to understand its subtlety. So not a sensational headline, this happened, that happened, this was said, that was said, but the pattern, the longer term presentation, the details, the change over time. Jesus talks about the sowing of the seed, the seed that is in shallow soil, the seeds that are eaten by the bird, the wheat with the yeast, the mustard seed, all these examples. Ramakrishna is saying, well, the wise person is like this person who lives in the forest and knows the secret of the chameleon and probably of the birds and other things. And then he makes it very clear, God is like that. Again, you know, maybe people are used to Ramakrishna, but it's sort of a scandalous in a way to say, that little animal over there on the tree, that's what God is like. God comes in different colors. Sometimes God has bright colors. Sometimes God has low-key colors. Sometimes God seems to have no color at all. Why are you so silly that you're fighting over this all the time? And you can say this among Hindu groups and among religions today. We're fighting because not enough of us live in the forest long enough to appreciate that God comes and goes in different ways. And I think the point is, yes, learn from nature and realize that you don't understand the forest until you've lived there for some time. You're not going to understand God if you're just like a Sunday visitor. You're not going to understand God if you just come once in a while for a lovely discourse and then go home. You've got to be like the person, you know, the fisherman who fishes, the woman who makes the bread each morning, the person who sells, who buys pearls, etc., etc., the person who lives in the forest and actually understands nature. Understanding God is like that. You've got to be there and take time. If you don't, you end up in silly, useless arguments with one another. Nature teaches you to be patient and learn from nature. Why do you think religion is similar to nature? So it's a parable. It's not the same as the parables of Jesus, but it's, I think it's a wonderful example. And then the third one, the final one, listen to a story. Again, Ramakrishna does say, now get out the book and turn to chapter 7, page 30, 37, and now we'll do the Sanskrit again. No, he said, I have another story to tell you. And you can imagine, as you read in the Gospel and the Great Master, uh, like Jesus had to get in the boat and the people were crowded on the shore, Wherever Ramakrishna was, there were people coming and going. I mean, the road from Calcutta was like worn down. Everybody in and out coming to listen to this extraordinary person. Why? There were a lot of pundits in Calcutta, where the great schools were. But this man told parables in a simple fashion that directly got at the meaning. So listen to a story. Once a woman went to see her weaver friend, the weaver who had been spinning different kinds of silk thread was very happy to see her friend. Friend, I can't tell you how happy I am to see you. Let me get you some refreshments. So she left the room. The woman looked at the threads of different colors and was tempted. She hid a bundle of thread under one arm. Uh, so this is a drama again, you know, the, the thief. Uh, it's like the sower of the seed. Some enemy comes and throws the seed. This is something that doesn't usually happen. So the weaver returned presently with the refreshments and began to feed her guests with a great enthusiasm. But looking at her thread, all lined up there, I'm sure, on the shelf or on the table, she realized that her friend had taken a bundle, like holding her arm there. Hitting on a plan to get it back, she said, friend, it's been so long since I've seen you. 
it's a great day of joy for me. I'm not going to, you know, call thief, thief. I don't want to alienate you, but let's dance. Uh, let's dance together. And the friend said, sister, I'm feeling very happy too. So they began to dance together. And when the weaver saw that her friend danced without raising her hands, her hands against her side because she didn't want to drop all the things she's stolen. Um, the weaver says, how is it, friend? Um, raise your hands. And the, the guest pressed one arm to her side and then danced raising only the other. So one up and one down because that's where the thread is. And come on, friend, why are you dancing with only one hand raised? Dance with me, raising both hands. See how I dance with both hands raised. But the guest pressed one hand to her side. She danced with the other hand raised and said with a smile, this is all I know of dancing. I can only do it this way. <laughs> now it sort of ends there. And, and the, 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 the people listening very well disposed to Ramakrishna, but saying, this is a very entertaining story, but what's the point? I don't get it. I love it. Is this just a distraction before he gets to the spiritual point? He's going to tell another holy story or something like that. What is the point? The answer is, the master concluded, I don't press my arm to my side. Both my hands are free. I am not afraid of anything. I accept Nitya and Leela, the absolute and the relative. Both arms are up. And again, it's, it's an ordinary story from ordinary life. Everybody there can say, well, I have friends who are wonderful friends, but they're a little bit dishonest sometimes. And if you're not looking, they'll take something. And it's this silly kind of thing of dancing with one hand down and one hand up. And you can see the thread popping out and so on like that. The entertainment, entertainment tell the story. And then the point is, all those things you read in Shankaracharya, uh, Brahma Sutra Bhashya, all these um, Vedanta manuals and all that about Leela Vibhuti, Nitya Vibhuti, the real and the, the world of phenomena, all of that is like when a woman comes to visit another woman and steals the thread and sticks it under her arm and has one or the other. And there are people, I think Ramakrishna is saying, who can only yearn for the Nitya Vibhuti, the eternal world, like people who can't stand this world because they're yearning for the kingdom of God. Or there are people who don't believe there's anything in this world, and they're only in this world. What you see is what you get. And they're only like that other hand up. And Ramakrishna says, don't you realize if you want to dance, you've got to use your whole body. If you want to know the reality of God, the whole thing, both arms up, don't be clinging to one bad conception or another bad conception. Let it go. Let all that stuff you've stolen in your life that's blinded you and cumbered you, <coughs> let go of it all and just join the dance. So it's a brilliant teaching because it's an entertaining story right to the end. And he puts in very, very simple words what the great theologians have tried to say in thousands of pages of writing. Both arms. The dance goes on. The real, the phenomenal, all of it is where God is. A third, a parable. So we have to stop now. And um, but what I want to conclude by saying, you know, you can read these parables over. And I also gave you my email address at the bottom. If you want to talk about it further, you can contact me. Um, is that it makes us think about not only, gee, I wish I was there when Jesus was teaching 2,000 years ago, or I wish I was there when Ramakrishna was teaching 125, 150 years ago because they were great teachers about ordinary life, teaching us about God. But rather, we live in 2017. Um, most of us are not villagers. <clears throat> most of us are not fishermen or farmers in Galilee. Most of us are not living on the outskirts of Calcutta near the jungle. And we're living in big cities like Sydney. We're living in cities like New York or Boston. We're city people. We live in the modern world. And say, oh, sadly, the world we live in teaches us nothing. The world they live in and taught them everything. I think the thing we need to do for our own sake and for our children's sake and our grandchildren in the future is realize that it's still true that the things of ordinary life teach us the things of God. And that if Jesus was here today, or Ramakrishna was here today, they probably wouldn't just talk about the things of the nature in the village. But they probably talk about things, you know, you're in the middle of Sydney and you're walking down, I'm staying near Miller Street, you're walking down Miller Street 
and you bump into somebody who's on their cell phone and they like crash into you and they turn that into a story. Or tomorrow I'm going out to the airport. You go to the airport and you have to go through security. You have to take this off and take that off and take this out of your bag. You go to immigration, they ask you these questions and all that. Turn that into a parable. And so on and so on. All the things of life, not just their lives then, but our life now, teach us about the mystery of God, the real and the unreal, how to find God in our lives. Particularly if you don't have a chance. I'm a professor, I get to sit in my office reading my books. If you're not a professor who gets to read your books all the time, but if you're alive, if you eat, if you drink, if you work, if you have neighbors, if you have friends, I think Ramakrishna and Jesus are both saying <coughs> all of that is the school of spirituality. Open your eyes to everything that happens to you every day. Tell your own parables about what you learned yesterday, the day before, tomorrow. And those things will teach you about God. And then you can pass it on to your friends, your children, your grandchildren. The things of God are just like this that happened yesterday. The things of God are the simple things of our ordinary life. So I guess I'd end there, and I think we don't have time for discussion. I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. But to say, you know, maybe as a prayer, that we who live in 2017 keep true to the message of Jesus and his parables, Ramakrishna and his stories, by realizing that God really is everywhere in our lives, and everything that happens to us each day teaches us how to find God.